Okay, uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the, the second day of the, uh, this conference on uh, alternative air drama communities. Uh, I'm Martin Carlson. I'm uh, the, one of the committee directing the conference, and I'm delighted to see you here. And, uh, congratulate you on getting up early in the morning to come to, the, come to the, uh, this first session. Uh, I want to begin with a few remarks about the subject of the conference and the CUNY Graduate Center, because this represents, it seems to be a very important uh, and unique convergence of interests, and I just want to speculate about that and, his, and place it historically a, a little bit. I do notice uh, that uh, uh, my opening remarks are, are have been entitled, this is not my choice, but it's great, <laughs> uh, Arab Dramaturgy's A Multiplicity of Options. Uh, I find that really quite striking and interesting. Uh, and that gives me a launch to go back to say, uh, I want to go back 20 years. Uh, and at that time, at the very end of the last century, we held a special conference here at the Graduate Center on the subject of contemporary theater in Egypt. Uh, Dalia Basuni, who is here, <laughs> helped organize that, was a, uh, was a graduate student at the time, and uh, uh, taught me everything I knew at that time about the Egyptian theater. Uh, the, uh, uh, she did a wonderful thesis on, on uh, 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 Arab, uh, uh, Arab American uh, performing artists. Uh, there, was a, there was and is a whole group of very important women performers in New York, and we'll talk, say a little bit more that, about that in a moment. Um, we had a one-day conference. It was really a, a very striking uh, event in many ways. As far as I know, it was the first academic conference held in North America about the modern era of theater, uh, which is really quite remarkable when you think about it. Uh, and I think back with this idea of multiple options. At that time, there was not even one option. That is to say, by and large, within the American academic community, if you ask people about the Arab theater, the answer would be, what Arab theater? Or is there an Arab theater? Um, uh, and as evidence of that, you have only to go back to the standard dramatic text that all graduate students and undergraduates in theater, in theater history, read at that time, which was Oscar Brockett's History of the Theater, which frankly states there is no theater in the Arab world. It says that, and it explains that, that, that the reason for that is that Islam prohibits any representation. Uh, totally false, of course, on, on a number of counts. But that was taught and believed universally, or almost universally, in the American theater at the end of the last century, and indeed up until that time. Then, around the turn of the century, uh, more and more that claim began to be challenged and refuted, and particularly, after 9-11, when there was a real interest in learning more about the Arab world, uh, which extended, of course, then not only to its politics, but to its culture, then, much to the astonishment of many American theater scholars, they discovered there was, in fact, uh, a thriving uh, theater tradition in much of the Arab world, which dated back for a century or more. Um, we had, when we had our conference at the end of the century, uh, here at the Graduate Center, uh, three of the leading dramatists of the uh, Egyptian theater at that time, uh, Leonard El Romley, Kamel uh, Maksud, and Alfred Farag, uh, and 
That in itself is really quite remarkable. These are these now are are, uh, are well known major figures of the last generation, and that we would have noticed them, invited them to New York, was really quite a remarkable thing. And the, and the proceedings of that conference, I just I found on my recent trip to Egypt, are well known and circulated, and are still looked back as an, an important document in 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 understanding and documenting the modern uh, era of theater. Uh, at that time, uh, most of us who were becoming aware of, the, of such theater were only aware of the Egyptian theater. And as time passed, we, our, our vision expanded and we realized not only is there a very important and thriving theater in Egypt, which goes back many generations, but in many other parts of the Arab world, in Iraq, in Syria, in Tunisia, in Algeria, and so on. So now we can talk about a variety and options in the theater in a way that uh, would have been quite unimaginable uh, 20 years ago. The Graduate Center in general, and the Siegel Center in particular, have played a key role in in illuminating those options for the American and international academic community. Uh, we have uh, published a whole series of books and translations uh, of Egyptian playwrights, Syrian playwrights like Sadala Wanous, uh, uh, who many consider the most important of the 20th century Amer uh, uh, Arab playwrights, uh, the uh, the plays of Jalila Bakar, or some of the plays of Jalila Bakar from Tunisia, who many consider to be the most important living Arab American or Arab playwright. Uh, we have also uh, established in 2005 here at the Graduate Center an ongoing journal, Arab Stages Online, which appears twice a year uh, and which is uh, continually a source of information uh, for interviews with Arab theater artists, uh, with uh, reviews of Arab plays, translations of new plays, historical articles about the Arab theater. Again, a kind of thing that was uh, totally impossible to access just a couple of decades ago. Uh, now all of that, which provides many, many options that were not available very recently in the past in terms of study and interest, I, I have to mention another very major part of, of the uh, of the interest of, uh, of CUNY and the development of, of this work here, and that is the diasporic Arab community. Um, very important from the very beginning of, as, as CUNY and the Single Center have been involved with making more available to the New York public the work of Arab theater artists has been the enormously important contribution of Arab American uh, theater artists. Uh, again, I, I must give enormous credit to Dahlia, who did extremely important pioneering work in, in uh, Arab American women uh, performance artists who really were uh, the, 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 the grounding of uh, modern Ameri Arab American theatrical work in New York. Uh, this is uh, this is a, a very important contemporary movement. Uh, a number of these artists have spoken at the Graduate Center. Uh, a number of them have performed in the Siegel Center, uh, and uh, in Arab stages, we are also. Uh, very strongly interested, not just in theater in the Arab world, but in the increasingly important diasporic theater, because of course today, with the huge refugee 
uh, population, uh, which includes obviously theater artists. There are very important diasporic Arab theaters in places like Spain, in Sweden, in Denmark, in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, uh, and all of this provides yet other options in this enormously complex uh, world of different dramaturgies presently developing. Among the Arab American performing artists, certainly one of the most important and one of the first really to, to achieve major distinction on the New York stage, uh, I'm happy to say is with us today, that is Shemaya. Uh, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce Betty to you. Many of you know her already or know her work. Uh, the Black Eye is her most famous work at the New York Theater Workshop. But she's had uh, a number of plays, some, some 15, I think, come together. Uh, and has been a, a very important force in the Arab American theater community now for, for the last, well, really the, much of this century. So uh, I'll turn this over to Betty now. She will uh, address you for a bit, and then afterward, perhaps, we'll have time to, to talk about this. Thank you.
And when human and women's rights are evoked as a justification for war, government officials are using the language of the left to cripple the ability of the people on the left to mobilize those in the middle. Now, in the case of the Vietnam War, the lefty artists weren't fooled. They didn't fill American stages with images of horrors of living under Viet Cong and communism. Unlike the theater artists of today, they resisted rather than reinforce the governmental narrative that was calling for war. And when I think about my contemporary theater writers of my generation, some who claim the identity of being leftist and some who claim the identity of being Arab American, I wonder if they are willfully ignorant or simply not up to the task of grasping the concept of Orientalism. The idea that creating distorted images of the Middle East serves as implicit justification that are linked to colonial and imperial ambitions. And what might theater that counters or even seriously question the war of terror looks like? <clears throat> Great theater is not about teaching people about what they do not know, but rather it is about awakening within them truths that they already do. The most potent political theater today would not look like what we call political theater at all. Instead of the maudlin stories that confine Arab or Muslim characters to either victims or perpetrators of the unimaginably horrific violence, depending on the political benefit of the writers, truly revolutionary theater, in my opinion, shows a reality that is harder to face. That even in the worst of times, the vast majority of Arabs and Muslims are simply ordinary human beings. They work, have their hearts broken, dream of only a slightly bigger house than they can afford, get aggravated by their family members, and struggle valiantly to be admired by those they admire. In short, their lives, deaths, hopes, fears, and fantasies are not that different from the majority of Americans and Europeans. And when you can find stories on the stage about Arabs and um, Muslims, to revolving exclusively around violence. It relegates the sum of the importance of a billion people to how they might or might not be affected by us. So what would it mean if there were more theater stories that sensitized audiences to the fact that despite the myriad of superficially varied ways that human cultures have blossomed across the globe for millennia, there is a human essence that unites us and it's utterly recognizable. In a world that is divided into nations that wage war on each other, it is theater's ability to humanize that makes it so politically potent. No one needs reminding that if some people who possess all the nuanced human complexity and capacity for feeling that we do have fewer rights, it is always connected to the fact that others have vastly more resources. And we who are complacent with that imbalance of power and resources mostly stay that way. I say we, I mean we. Because, not because we're ignorant, but because we know that the imbalance falls in our favor. And that political idea is the simplest to grasp and the hardest to swallow. It's much easier to tell ourselves stories that reinforce and solidify our conception about our differences through the medium of theater. Though the medium of theater at its best is designed to reveal how much we all remain inescapably the same. So when I first came to New York, I wanted to create theater that was actually anti-ethnic theater. So my first show was called Chocolate and Heat, and I subtitled it Growing Up Arab in America. And I proceeded to give you a show that had Arabs in it, but had nothing, it was about love and sex and uh, sexual violence, all within the context of having Arab characters, but their identity was never discussed. So you, I presented a show that was supposedly about Arabs and gave people a show that was just about people and asked them to make their own conclusions about what the political point I was trying to make. That was three weeks before 9-11. Um, that the show sold out at the Fringe Festival. We did really well. People were into the idea of like kind of exploding the idea of what an ethnic show that would be subtitled Growing Up Arab in America would look like what its themes were. I wanted to just humanize. And that's what I have in my, these are my shows in America, um, really tried to do with my work. Just really tried to, to not show victims or perpetrators of violence because I think that that is for me the most politically important point I could make. 
So I am um, uh, going to end now. We'll be to talk tomorrow a little bit. Um, and I just want to thank you all for being here. And thank you. Okay.
Meanwhile, I know a lot of writers who are doing some nice work, interesting work, new work, that are not finding a place on the stage. So it's a fascinating gap between the writing and what the theater makers are choosing to create. That's a, a, a first introduction. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm going to be speaking in the next uh, session, actually, using two of uh, the plays that we've done in uh, the Theatre Initiative to give examples of two different kinds of uh, what we're calling Arab dramaturgies or like approaches to dramaturgy. So I'm not going to repeat myself, but to also make um, observations about what's happening in Lebanon today. We, uh, you know, contrary to probably what you just said about Egypt. Um, I think it's more in the directorial, directorial dramaturgies in Lebanon. We, the, the playwriting tradition is really almost non-existing. Like, you, you have like some new voices. I would name Arzi Khadr, Maya Zbib, you know. Um, these are two females playwright today in Lebanon that are producing it as directors but also as writers. But it's not really something that, you know, that's developing. On the other side, what's really developing at a fast pace, I would say, is uh, different aesthetic uh, choices and styles, you know, a combination of different methods, different ways of uh, producing theater in found spaces, alternative spaces, you know, uh, the theater buildings, it's happening at, at a big scale, and, you know, and it's actually, what's also interesting is that it's going outside the big city, you know. It's not as much as we would like, but it's also, you know, it's, uh, so. Good morning. Uh, I don't even you know, have any pretension or have any, any great insight, but whatever I do <coughs> comes from these, uh, uh, besides the work we have done together, these two forthcoming books, one on Sadalawanus, um, uh, which includes his theoretical writings. I think one of the most um, poignant, important things that he says is that uh, he rejects uh, uh, the sort of sight, the uh, clip of the line of having um, a, a kind of civilizational base on which to build. He absolutely rejects it. The idea that there is some Arab essence. Um, and I think. Uh, um, coming from a secular uh, Marxist uh, Eastern Bloc artist, um, that sort of the prehistory of the present um, reinforces also that um, uh, contrary to what many people in, say, North America think, um, this uh, dynamic did not begin on September 11th, 2001. It antedates it for, you know, by centuries, and I think it is um, a specious, uh, uh, in the extreme to suggest that um, uh, dramaturgy or anything else be seen through the lens of the attack of 9-11. I think that should be right out there. Uh, I like the way that, you know, uh, Be uh, Betty dealt uh, with that. Um, another couple of trends that, you know, I think, again, by doing a history of the last uh, 50 years, picking five plays, which is what, uh, uh, Nanda and I did in the other book, which is forthcoming from Brill, um, uh, starting uh, with uh, The Dictator by the Sama Fus. Um, here you have one of the key elements, I think, in what is going on now, at least, you know, um, in the Lebanese theater, but I think uh, beyond, is um, a recognition that uh, um, uh, writing Fusha is the final residue of Arab nationalism, and it will go. And we've seen this, uh, it's been put to the test by doing um, uh, uh, King Lear and Blood Wedding in um, uh, Lebanese vernacular. And the way that people respond to the vernacular on stage, um, they immediately own it. It speaks to their lives. You may say, oh, it's Aristotelian, it's, a, you know, but you have a completely different relationship between audience. Uh, and performer. And in fact, Jawad al Asadi, who's also in that volume, uh, his Hamam Baghdadi, which you so kindly you know, did an event when I brought him here to New York when his play was done on Broadway, has rewritten his own play in, in Iraqi vernacular. Um, his way of updating, he, 
he came to the conclusion himself, he's that earlier generation, that it doesn't make sense to have two brothers who are a bus driver speaking to each other in Fusa. It's just, you know, uh, why would you do that? And what he does is, it's a very difficult and specific vernacular, I must say, unless you're, you know, Iraqi, it's daunting, it's whatever, but what it feels like is it has a kind of texture. So the final thing I would say then, uh, that's evolved from looking at different places, whether it's uh, um, the Taha's, uh, where would I find someone like you, Ali, the, the works of uh, Wanus of uh, Muhammad al-Marut, um, is almost everywhere that you look, you see these configurations that go well beyond the so-called Arab world. Um, whether, they're, whether they're drawing on Ionesco, uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of Mahfouz, or uh, Mohadej is uh, looking at Othello, uh, is that it was always there, that the, the Arab theater was always um, uh, uh, much larger than it's construed in the area of studies. And I think those two things you see in the dramaturgy. This, uh, this uh, tension that Robert is, speaks of uh, between the vernacular and, and the patois, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the classic form, is really and has been for, for decades a central concern in the Arab theater. Uh, it doesn't really have a correspondence in the in the diasporic theater, although I think there is a, a similar kind of tension. I'd like to ask Betty to comment on this between the first thing that Robert spoke about, and that is uh, uh, the Arab essence, or what is it to be Arab? Uh, and it seems to me that uh, that right at the heart of, uh, of the challenge to America. An Arab American performer is that question. Betty spoke about uh, the, the 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 desire and, and the obligation to let people know that Arabs are human beings. They're, 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 they have a uh, they have an existence uh, which is like everybody else's. And I'd like to ask Betty to to elaborate a little bit more on the tension between being an Arab American. Uh, performer and an American performer. Well, is this on? Uh, you know, for me, I create, a, for every play that I get produced, I probably write, write three. And it's, so, what is interesting to me <coughs> is that, and we talked a little about it, it's, it's the market curates what the world sees. And so I, but I make a very conscious effort to localize and humanize my stories. And by that I mean taking out violence as the core part of the identity of Arabs or Arabness or Arab uh, essence. Because I feel like what happens, so I'm in a very strange place because I know that if I was in Palestine, the kind of work I would create would have a lot more to do with women's rights and a lot of the things that I think need to change within the dialogue of Arab culture. Um, and I know I'm not speaking exactly to your point, but for me, one, I'm hyper-conscious of what images I'm putting out there of Arabness in an environment like New York, where the only images you see of Arabs are in relation to violence, whether perpetrators of violence or victims of violence. And, I, and I'm, you know, and so what I consciously try to do is just show the humanity and, and delete that kind of, you know, uh, duality of you're only important and only on an American stage if, if you're reinforcing how you relate to us, which is either as our victim or as our oppressor. So, you know, I, I live right in between two worlds. I grew up speaking Arabic as my first language, and I lost it when I went to school. And so I'm a Palestinian <laughs> um, in America, but I'm an American in Palestine. And so I have a very clear sense of how much these kinds of concepts make no sense, because 
they don't. And so, uh, okay. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, let, me, let me open the uh, discussion up to the audience. Uh, I, we'd be happy to hear any thoughts or questions you have to any of us. Uh, Frank, will you sort of take charge of this? Any comment? Yes. And I think the microphones are working. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for all these ideas. I would like to uh, come back to what you say about uh, and, uh, this uh, maybe lack or like a, we, we lack a bridge between writer and makers, theatre maker, because this is a very important issue. I would add another uh, comment on it is that um, I observe uh, all these years in uh, especially in North Africa and also in some cases for Syrian play writer, there is kind of a, a move that the maker, the theatre maker, is also the writer. So there is a, a, what we call in French lecture, uh, écriture scénique. So it's on stage, it's happening during the process. And many of those uh, artists are making theatre from uh, their own materials and their like references from the socio-political situation and so on. And I, uh, you have uh, uh, Mohammed al attar you have Leila Suleiman in Egypt, and uh, Wa'il Ali with Crystal Khodr in Beirut, um, Mustafa Belfodil in Algeria, so you have many of them. Dries Kisikas in Morocco, working with uh, what we call Daba Theater, so the theater of today. So it's, uh, there is also another way of uh, giving theater to the like in the, in the process in the timing it's uh, like more uh, faster than before with uh, all this taking <coughs> play translating thinking it, it would be better in dialect or in Fosca. so there is a kind of uh, need of uh, re uh, reacting and uh, bringing uh, their uh, artistic universe back to the audience and the community so that's what I want to to say maybe we have to think of this new um, stages position and bridging maybe those. I, I have a presentation this afternoon all about the immediate theater that happened or that continues to happen. So I didn't um, want to start now because I'm going to have like 15 minutes, only 15 minutes for that. <laughs> Um, but I, I myself, I am a theatre maker, I write my own work and I direct it and I haven't released any of my plays to anybody else to work with them yet. Um, and there is a lot of current work that is trying to respond by, by that, using that model. Um, and the documentary theatre and verbatim theatre and different modules of theatre of, of the oppressed. So uh, it, it's an important module, but I was too, like, taking a step back and looking at why would young Egyptian writers um, return to classics and, or stick to Hamlet or Macbeth year after year, not, not once? So it's just an interesting uh, choice for maybe safety or distance or other political situation. Um, thank you, yes. Um, I'd like to just shift the conversation a little bit towards the question of methodology. Um, this is an opportunity to speak to the editorial board of the Arab Stages. And um, so the, the question is a very open-ended one, but I'm, I'm following up on Marvin's introductory remarks about the idea of multiplicity. Um, because, you know, the Arab Stages is a, is a remarkable and unique journal in that it proposes a, a certain kind of epistemology. It, it creates a form of knowledge that didn't, well, it, it existed in, in, act, in practice but there was no journal to um, aggregate and to theorize and to document and to develop the, the knowledge of an, of an Arab, of Arab stages. Um, it's a slightly speculative question. If, if you had um, endless resources and, and endless time to think, what would an Arabic epistemology of theater look like in a journal? What would it, because certainly we have essays and we uh, reviews and uh, a certain kind of methodology, but 
you know, I'm thinking about the need to also, um, uh, in, a, in a sense, replicate certain kinds of Western logocentric knowledge that exists within an academy, i.e. a referee journal, but also to think about how we might um, uh, develop or expand on or, or develop different forms of knowledge in the journal as well that are, that are perhaps more situated within the local culture and local community. So you could think about what does an Arabic modernity look like? What does an Arabic intellectual community look like? How is that reflected in uh, an academic journal of this kind? So it's a very speculative, open-ended question. I'll, I'll take a little step at it. Uh, one thing that might, uh, you know, uh, it's an incredible resource. I'm, you know, I'm just enormously, I'm enormously grateful for it. I, you know, look at it closely. I read what's in it. Um, I think uh, one thing that's informing our practice, which, um, you know, it's not connected uh, necessarily in a direct way, is um, the scholarship of people like Marvin like uh, Ilham Huri Magdusi, like Karim Magdusi, that engages in this reconfiguration, um, uh, historicizing, um, through the case of uh, Ibn Daniel and uh, Ibn Daniel uh, being connected to Aristophanes. Um, uh, Ilham Huri Magdusi looking at radicalism in the Eastern Mediterranean. I was talking to Maximilian yesterday about the relationship between Greece uh, and uh, the Levant, uh, in general, um, this is something that's looked at there. This is exactly what uh, Sahar's doing in her practice by creating a med lab, um, uh, as it were. Uh, Karim Magdusi, the historian from Rice, um, also looking at areas of history from the Balkans, from Turkey, from the Levant and Egypt uh, that are contemporaneous and looking at that history as opposed to area studies kinds of histories, you get different answers that inform practice. So um, what that reinforces is the extent to which um, this kind of cultural back and forth that's taking place between Europe and the Arab world has been going on for centuries in the same way that the, the world did not, this relationship did not begin on 9-11 in North America. In Europe, the relationship between this part of the world and Europe, um, obviously Saeed has given us one optic, one prism for looking at it. I think there are a number of useful other uh, optics for practitioners to look at those uh, relationships and um, the extent to which that's integrated. Um, and it's not simply a report on current practice, right? What is informing the practice? And obviously it can be social media, obviously it can be technology, um, you know, uh, it can be a range of things, but uh, perhaps because I'm first and foremost a cultural historian, um, I think that uh, it has a way of, of uh, informing our worldview. Um, and as artists, we have a worldview, and sometimes the practice of artists leads us forward, and sometimes the historians and the scholars lead the way, and the, the artists kind of then take their cue from them. Uh, I think, you know, the two in tandem, uh, uh, that's the one thing that I would, you know, sort of uh, uh, say about it. At the same time, what a beautiful resource, and uh, we're so grateful uh, for it. I, 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 I will just add, add on to that. Uh, I, I totally agree with, uh, with the, the, the observations and, uh, and even more with the, 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 uh, the impetus of life behind it. Uh, I think that the real challenge that uh, we have both as citizens of the modern world and as theater practitioners is to try to work with the knowledge that the world is not centered on Europe. We all grew up with that idea and we were indoctrinated with that idea that the theater is a European invention, that the only theater is that, that exists is European. Uh, Obviously, this is 
a restricted view. Uh, but the implications there, it's, I mean, it's easy to say that, but then the implications of, of, of saying, all right, now let's really begin to think about alternatives, to seek out alternatives and consider the implications of it. That's work. Then you really have to learn about other cultures. You have to learn other languages. Uh, you have to travel. You have to, uh, you have to experience other performative conditions and so on. That's a heavy job. Uh, and of course, nobody can do it alone. Uh, the world is too big and too complicated. But if as, as a profession and as a, a discipline, we in theater commit ourselves to becoming more global, then we can take some important steps. See, I think the biggest problem now is to uh, look at this vastly expanding world of possibilities and say, I can't do that. I can't do all of that. I, I can't relate to all of that. Uh, and then give up and then say, well, all right, uh, I'm comfortable in the English 18th century, that's it. Uh, I, 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 uh, if that's your solution, that's your solution. But I do think that that we all ought to really take seriously the challenge to keep pushing out. And, I mean, as Robert says, it's not just a it's not just a contemporary, but it's a historical situation. I'll be talking about this a little this afternoon. Uh, but uh, 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 again, I, I can only very strongly underline what Robert says that that the the uh, the interpenetration and interrelationship of different parts of the globe go back forever. Uh, and as I begin working on Ibn Daniel, and this is the 13th century, I find that uh, uh, there's all sorts of networks and connections that have really not been looked at seriously at all. That uh, uh, I, I am totally convinced, again, I'll say a little bit more about this this afternoon, that Ibn Daniel was profoundly influenced by the contemporary Byzantine theater. About which, about which very little has been studied. Not that there's not more material there, but it's just who is interested in Byzantine theater. And yet, uh, here is a key bridge between what we think of as the East and West. The whole theatrical uh, world along the Silk Route and, and, the, and the theatrical and performance traditions that are connected with that all through what we, what we in the West call the Middle Ages, um, uh, has been very, very little looked at by historians. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the, the challenge is a vast one, but I think that perhaps the most important thing for our generation is to acknowledge that this challenge exists. To say, this is something that must now we must turn our attention to it. We can't get away with saying, well, if it's Western Europe, it's okay. Otherwise, they don't win. This was just a comment about how um, your comments about finding comfort in the vernacular reminded me of Brian Dorhey's you know, Theater of War. <laughs> so I guess um, there are a lot of, but that is more in terms of using the Greek classics for veterans combating PTSD, but um, I guess if you want to elaborate on that thought, if, you know, in terms of parallels in the Arab world, you know, I know we don't want to talk about, you know, victims, but, you know, more about um, aspects of, you know, Arab communities that are also affected by PTSD because of, you know, colonization or war. I don't know if this will probably like uh, speak to what you're saying, but this this whole idea of Arab dramaturgies and Arab identity really challenges me personally when I think about it because I don't wake up every day thinking about my Arab identity. And I think 
one thing that plays into you know that plays into the the, the equation here is that living and I speak about myself really and I only represent myself and just my experience in Lebanon. When when you live in a country that you have uh, you know um, nothing in terms of let's say civil services, no infrastructure, you have a garbage crisis, you have a warlord leading the country, you have the warlords that um, did the 15 years war are still in office, you have uh, no democratic, like you have nothing really. The priorities become these problems, not the problem of, for me personally, how am I represented in the West or how do people see me or what do I, you know. So. That question of the vernacular, I think this is what we're doing, really, and we're only, I, I loved what Wafa said yesterday about how his, his purpose really comes, or he discovers his purpose in the process, you know, and I, I like that idea, and I think this is what's happening with us in a way that, you know, we do King Lear, yes, and people say, why King Lear? You know, we do King Lear in, in the vernacular, and for some people, it's the first, the, like, I've heard feedback such as, well, <coughs> I understood Shakespeare for the first time. Um, but why King Lear? Yes, it's because this crazy king, you know, dissecting the kingdom, throwing everything away. You live this on a daily basis. It's written, what, you know, 500 plus years ago, but you live this today. Why August Osage County? This is a play that's happening Midwest, Oklahoma. It has nothing to do with Lebanon. It has everything to do with Lebanon, the idea of the family and the, you know, the, so all these Lorca, you know, the love story in Lorca, the, the, Pressed desires and work out. So, you know, it, in, it, like I don't want to be simplifying the issue too much or philosophizing about it too much, but I think I, personally, as a theater maker, I start from what speaks to me and what I need to say and what I need to understand. This is my, you know, and at this point in my life, um, in my career, I, you know, the, the, that air of identity is not surfacing, you know, it's just for some reason. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to say something that I was so moved by Marvin's question of who cares about Byzantine theater. And one of the things that is, is really, I think, essential to me is it's, it's the question of who cares. Because you have the oral tradition of Shahrazad. You have the most famous storyteller that in, in any iconic context being a Middle Eastern woman who tells stories to save her life. And if that was highlighted, and what I think the work that you're doing at Arab Stages is so important because people need to be told what's important. People, if Byzantine theater was suddenly seen as connected to Shakespeare and everybody wanted to do, you know, the updated Byzantine play or the, you know, being set in Kosovo, you know what I mean? Like, I think the academics and what you said, Robert, really mattered to me too about, um, that sometimes it's the academics, it's the academics who tell us what's worth studying, whether it's Byzantine or whether it's the oral tradition of Shahrazad and Hakawatis, which I think is intimately connected to everything in the West from stand-up comedy to this preponderance of one-person shows. You know, like when I was coming out of theater school, the idea of somebody doing a one-person show and not being on Broadway was crazy. But now it's it's a whole new form, and I think it's coming back to that. You know, and if we were to, to elevate what exists within Arab culture, which is the Hakawati tradition, which is the oral tradition, and say suddenly that's as important as Shakespeare, this idea of stories within stories and stories saving the life of a woman, uh, you know, if that was elevated by academics, we would suddenly, as an audience and theater makers, suddenly wake up and be like, oh, I've got to do the the new Shahrazad set, and you know. And I think it's, it's very important, and that's what's so critical about having venues like Arab Stages, to, to articulate. And, you know, for me, um, as I said, for every play that I do show, I um, have three plays that aren't produced. So I'm very conscious of what actually gets curated by the economics of being an Arab in this city and in this culture. Um, but as an artist, you know, the, the thing that I'm most excited about is I did a sequel to Twelfth Night. I finally feel like I've written enough and I've expressed enough about what it means to be Arab in this context that I can actually go back to what I, at the core, am is somebody who's deeply interested in theater. Um, and so thank you, Arab Stages.
for, get, for leading the way and saying that this is an important thing worth studying and what we articulate actually influences what artists make. Uh, let, me, uh, let me put in a plug for Target Margin Theater, which has committed itself to an ongoing Sherazon project that started last year. I think they're in the third uh, phase of it now, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite, a, quite an interesting undertaking. Um, and then let me go on to uh, 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 shift around, as I like to do, and look at things from a different perspective, and that is uh, uh, I'm going to defend Shakespeare uh, and the Arab world. Uh, the, it, I think it is important to remember two or three things uh, about uh, about European influence and about use of European subjects, King Lear, Twelfth Night, whatever. Uh, like it or not, uh, the European influence is enormous. I mean, this is we're living in a post-colonial period. We're aware of this. Uh, uh, we might say, oh, it's too bad that Europe has dominated the world in such a way, but it has. I mean, it's a historical fact. Uh, the, it, it's all very well to say, uh, whether you believe it or not, or whether, it, whether you would be right or not, to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone in India spoke Hindi uh, instead of English? Uh, but that's not going to happen. Uh, the, 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 there, there, are, there are facts on the ground. We start with where we are. And where we are is a post-colonial situation. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I am not at all uncomfortable with the fact that, uh, that uh, Hamlet is such a popular uh, character in the Egyptian theater uh, any more than I was with the fact that Hamlet was a very popular character in the Eastern European theater in the old Soviet days. What was being done then, and and this and Sherazade is being used the same way, of course, in in countries, and alas, there are many of them in the Arab world today, where it is very tricky to do contemporary work. Uh, the traditional and generally accepted way to make political statements is by something that indeed can be represented as outside the culture, like Shakespeare. Uh, you make your political statements uh, by by making uh, Claudia stand from Bubara or whatever it happens to be. Uh, that's a very useful device and, and, and is a, a time-honored device. So that when we talk about, uh, I guess I'm just saying this is a very complicated question. That is to say, uh, like it or not, cultures are hybrid now and are becoming more hybridized all the time. And I think that our responsibility is to be aware of this, conscious of it. We can't fight it, it is just something that happens. But we can, we can, uh, we can view it intelligently, see what is going on, ask what is going on, and indeed look at, at other possible hybridizations or other possibilities as this conference suggests, uh, alternative possibilities, alternative dramaturgies. What other things are open to us by getting broader and clearer knowledge of other world cultures? But I don't, I don't think we need to deplore uh, the influence of Shakespeare. It's, it's, it is a, it is a fact, and it, there are many parts of it that ought to be celebrated. Um, Stefan. Well, uh, you know, I had sort of two questions, and both of them have already been answered. Uh, so, uh, you know, how is it? Uh, how is it uh, when I am reading about the Arab theater and I'm listening to you talking? Uh, unlike uh, if we were to talk maybe about Indian theater or African theater or whatever, we would be talking a great deal about the idea of post-colonialism and, uh, and, and, and kind of the Western influence and uh, cultural imperialism and, uh, 
and, and as I understand it, much of the modern Arab theater really has developed in the 19th century under the influence of uh, you know, the, the British and the French and all that. Uh, and at this point, it seems to have, and I don't know whether this is a provocative statement, but it seems to have, uh, it seems to have become, it seems to be taken from, for granted that those influences are there. Uh, are there you as playwrights, uh, theater makers in the Arab world? Are they are they ways as to how to sort of consciously hark back to some uh, Arab and Middle Eastern traditions that go really, really, really far back? And how do you as theater makers and how uh, and, and playwrights do that? Where do you go? How do you use those kinds? Of in order to create those kinds of hybrids, really, and those kinds of transcultural uh, products uh, that seem to be uh, part of what we are seeing. I want to start. Please. Uh, on what uh, Betty was saying, the, cul the, cul the production is connected to the funding and the culture uh, production in general. Is, um, in, in my case, I do independent theater in Egypt, and sometimes I get commissions. The last two commissions I had were from the American Cultural Center, part of the embassy. And to, to produce work in Egypt, they want the work to have something American in it, so that they can justify their mandate of spreading the American culture. <laughs> As if we don't have American culture. So I need to write proposals that say, I will loosely base my project on this blog. It started initially by them asking me to Arabize the crucible. And I said, okay, it's an interesting play and it would work wherever, whenever we are, wherever we are. And eventually they said it would be very difficult to get the licensing because I have to translate it back to English for the estate of the playwright. So give me, it's like, just write a new play, why don't you? I was like, okay. <laughs> so I created a new play that is based on the idea of a witch trial. And I wanted to make it my own, so I went back to the culture, the songs that people sing in the fields. I went even further back to ISIS and the idea of spreading your wings and flying. And I created a new play that is completely Egyptian and new and steeped in the uh, folk tradition of the songs of the fields and the ancient tradition of the pharaohs. But they can legitimize their, fund, their funding or spending it because it is the story. It is, so that did not, was not successful in, a, in future productions, unfortunately, <laughs> of, uh, of other plays where they um, asked me to do something, yeah, about women. And I said, can I do something like uh, maybe Cuckoo's Nest, but for women? <laughs> and no, too controversial. <laughs> something else about women, uh, but not that. <laughs> Um, I propose something based loosely on stage doors. Um, so it's a play about women in the theater auditioning. And for me to make it interesting, I would have them audition or rehearse something about the revolution, because this is what I want to speak about. And they said, great, I got the funding, I started writing, did my readings with my actors just to get a feel of the play, submitted the play for them. Next morning, 9 a.m., I mean, it means as soon as they reached their office, they said, page 9, 10, and 11, say the word Thaura, revolution. I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, you can't. Like, what do you mean? I wrote a proposal about a play that people are rehearsing for something I call Opera Tahrir. It's a dream of mine to do a musical about Tahrir Square. And they said, oh, but you can't mention the revolution. It would not work because we would be seen as instigating revolution and they completely censored the play. I mean, you cannot do this play. Eventually, after <clears throat> much turmoil, I wrote another play uh, where I presented the revolution visually. So it was not on the text. <laughs> they liked the text clean without the, <laughs> the words as you did when you were talking about your censorship issues. It's like, it's not there, I will work with it visually. So I I am aware of like being in between worlds and uh, the post-colonial situation, but this, these are the only people who trust my process and would work with me, and these are the conditions. And sometimes I say, no, I just hide in my form and I just continue to be a farmer and forget about theater, but there are so many stories I want to tell, so I am in that constant conversation and negotiating 
when, what do I give up to in order to be able to do the work? And coincidentally, my second play was about that. The conversation between the playwright and the director, both are me in reality. I, the show must go on, but how about the authenticity and the integrity of the play? Do you want the play to be shown at all? Some of the play or nothing at all. So it's uh, unfortunately um, censorship in, in many different ways, some finan financial and some political, but uh, we still want to work and the show must go on. So what can we do to present what we want to do and our, our real stories uh, within the current circumstances? Yeah, I can give an, an example also from a theater practitioner in Lebanon who works with drama therapy, and that would you know speak uh, speak about how this traditional uh, you know uh, like the, the storytelling tradition, for instance, the Arabic storytelling tradition, how it it is really uh, played within the contemporary theater, and would also speak about the which I totally agree with the, how we live today really hybrid cultures, and especially in the theater. The theater culture, I think, is very hybrid. Zena the Kash, the drama therapist, like her two famous plays in Lebanon, uh, you know, took place uh, in prison settings. So she would work with the men's prison and the women's prison. When she did the play with the men's prisons, she used as a device the play 12 Angry Men, and she made it into 12 Angry Lebanese. That was the <laughs> essence of the play. But when she worked with the women's prison, the, the device that she used was the Shahrazad storytelling. So the play was called Shahrazad and Abda, Shahrazad and the prison of Abda. And they both spoke, you know, perfectly with the audiences. And they actually, the first play led to a change in, uh, in a Lebanese law. It led to actually enforcing a law that was, you know, passed but was never enforced about, you know, prison statements. So these things happen all the time. But honestly, you know, Sometimes you do it unconsciously, you know, it's part of your repertoire also and baggage as a human being to begin with. I just want to say something that's just so evident to me right now. And, you know, when I talk about economic censorship, and Dalia talks about the same sort of thing, but also actual censorship, I don't think any other culture, and maybe I'm making too blanket a statement, but if you think about it, we're all talking about how we can say things or, and get them heard, and I don't know if we were doing a Latin American or an African, that there would be this much pressure on Arabs, whether they're working in an American theater context or working in the Arab world, about dancing around trying to get even a part of what you want to say heard. And it's so, it's it's striking to me that, 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 that you know, and I, I'm, not a big identities person. I think we're, we all are multiple things. I think being a playwright is my identity more than because I chose it more than anything else I could have been born into. But um, but I think we're all dancing around the same sort of thing, and I don't think any other culture has as much more. And I think it's connected to the politics of of, of what's happening in the region. I don't and what's happening in America and how what's happening in America is affecting what's happening. I can't imagine, think of any other culture that would have both the artists within the Western context feeling economically censored, trying to dance around and, and get a portion of, what, of their humanity on stage, and also those working. And I just want to put that out there. Well, I would say that, Dolly, I, I, uh, I run the Center for American Studies <coughs> at, uh, at uh, the American University of Beirut. And when I, I hear the word when spreading culture, when you say spread, if you hear the word American and spreading in the same sentence, <laughs> run for your life. That's, you know, whatever they're spreading, you, you don't want to be spread, right? Um, this uh, is my culture. And then spread. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to be spread. You don't want to end up spreading on you. Um, but uh, I think Benny said something. Uh, uh, it's really quite important. I think we acknowledge it in the case of African American uh, literature, culture, theater, um, this cultural morality. Um, I know that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Marvin's work on Ibn Danielle, uh, which you know I was really intrigued with, and then uh, recently wrote an article about how uh, Ibn Danielle is the clear source of Rojas' Celestina. There's absolutely no doubt, but to put that together, and this is, you know, Rojas' Celestina, 
many people would put it right up there with Quixote, one of the great sources of modern, uh, the modern European novel, theater, etc. Once you look, it's incredibly hard because it's uh, oral traditions in the Iberian Peninsula. There's really no doubt. So this interpenetration, um, it's important when we talk about post-colonialism that we acknowledge, um, and as I was talking about uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Menocal's work that makes it clear that uh, without the, the Arabs in Spain, there's no Boccaccio, there's no Petrarch, there's no Chaucer, um, there's uh, uh, no Provencal poets, right? Um, every, you know, all of these things that are seen as the wellspring of Western literature. So you can think both things at the same time. And I think that, you know, one reason that we work together so well is, is Sahar is sort of, uh, uh, the glasses half full in terms of practice. I can keep filling it up. And I'm uh, saying, well, look at what's missing from the puzzle, whether it's Margaret Lippmann's work on, on uh, Arab Hamlet or the new work that she's doing on Russian uh, influence in the Arab world, is that um, as soon as we confine our universe, um, what we do is create a dramaturgy which is reductionist. By its nature, it's reductionist. Um, so uh, clearly, through practice, you're trying to define your dramaturgy, but as you and Betty are saying, um, uh, without some platform, uh, or trying to follow the money, what we do is have a little bit of money. We have a little bit of money, and within that, we can do whatever we can get away with, with the censor. Should I not say that? Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe very short. We have to go to the next question, but running out of time. Uh, well, I, I, yes, I, I want to uh, just expand on that. My mind flashes back to our first conference on contemporary drama in Egypt, uh, which, which uh, I mentioned before that Dahlia helped to organize, and in the discussions which followed, and uh, the discussions are in part reproduced in the proceedings. In the discussions which followed, censorship was the main concern. And uh, it was, I, I, I'm interested in how little things have changed in a sense. That is to say, we had a representative, which I think we don't have today, uh, from the Egyptian Cultural Service in, in uh, in New York, who stood up and said, there is no censorship in Egypt, which I'm sure is what would be said today. Uh, and I'll just let that pass. Uh, but, but I would say that uh, uh, one of the responses, I think it was Lennon L. Romney's response, but maybe not, in any case was, well, there's censorship and censorship. That is, uh, even if there is not state censorship, there's economic censorship which everybody in the United States must understand. It is, it is naive to say, oh, there is no censorship in the United States. You can do anything you want. Well, obviously you can. And to some extent, there is economic censorship anywhere, everywhere. Uh, in, in addition to political censorship there. And again, this is not a question of, uh, of overt, uh, uh, overt saying you can't say that, but it is a question of, as an especially theater, theater is especially vulnerable because it is a certain amount of material supports necessary just to put the thing out there. Um, and so uh, uh, I just want to remark that it, it does strike me that, that it, these concerns, I mean, even in terms of these concerns, have not in fact changed a great deal in 20 years. One last question and then. Yeah, I was curious uh, to um, ask. I'm uh, curious about it, what I, in, in, in Lebanon as well, but I know in Egypt there's the popular theatre, comedies, and then there's the experimental underground. Is there is it is there anything in between, or is it just popular comedies, and then there's this wide gap? And you get to sort of the experimental theater where you know crowd shot for that and 
Are there any bridges? Is that an amp? Is that the same in uh, uh, the, the exception formula has a lot of uh, categories. Uh, some of them are the government-run theaters. So there is the Sakafa Kabiliraya, the cultural palaces, the cultural clubs, and they, they, each of them has their own like <coughs> clubs and um, competitions and festivals. And the public theater, which is like 14 theaters in Cairo, two in Alexandria, um, the independents and the experimental. And the independents have been um, having harder time in Egypt, but many of them have access to other places. So Laila Suleiman showing her work in Europe, uh, um, Ahmed Al-Attar opening his place abroad first and then in, in Cairo. Um, what happened in the last few years, which is um, not something I'm very happy about, is something called Masrah Masr, Egypt's Theater, and it's a weekly television, tele televised play, that many people think this is a theater because many, very few people go to the theater. Cairo has 22 million people, has 14 stages, four of them are closed. So very few people are theater goers. I mean, I go to the theater and I'm shaking hands with everybody as if it's a funeral. I, mean, I know most of the audience in many of the smaller plays. Uh, so Masrah Masr becomes the theater and defines the theater. And many of the young ones who have never been to a live performance see this as theater and it's mainly <coughs> bad vaudeville slapstick comedy making fun of people like weight or height or skin color or whatever but it's the weekly dose and another model uh, was based on it so now there are two or three of these <coughs> that are televised they do one one play a week and they show it and they don't even bother to write it so uh, it's a uh, it's a new uh, addition but it's not a very healthy one I Yeah, I think in Lebanon, and Robin can also speak about that, I think there's a range of things happening. You have, on one side, the social comedies, very commercial, you know, successful in terms of box office social comedies. You have device theater that, you know, companies like Zuhaf are doing, or, uh, you know, Collective Kahraba, they work with puppetry and masks. Uh, um, you know, we're doing, you know, we did the last of our work was Blood Wedding, but we done a variety of different things. So it's very eclectic in a way, like work, people are working with verbatim documentary techniques, you know, uh, uh, translation happens a lot because yeah, if it's a if a text that's already tested, you know, and it, it can sell and it can speak to people and people will be interested in it. But the, the, the la some of the last plays I've watched in Lebanon you know, has to do with, like, one of them was very also successful in terms of box office was called Hacker Shay, like, uh, Talk of the Men or something like that, like, interviews, based on interviews with men. Uh, but also different uh, different forms of theater is really very, uh, you know, prospering in Lebanon. Playback theater, drama therapy, improvisational theater, puppetry, you know, all sorts of things, really. And Beirut is a very small city with, right now, we have, maybe five theaters, like Medina, Sunflower, Mono, Babel just closed down last year, and Zohaf opened their studio, and the rest are really alternative spaces. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, it's not one thing that's happening, but two things, like extremes. Okay, thank you, Shani. Uh, it's, we've come to the end of our time now. I, I really would very much like to thank Bethy, Sava, Robert, Double, you are wonderful panelists for this variety of, of perspectives and alternatives for dramaturgy. Uh, and to begin with a round of applause, please. Thank you. So we have a, a couple of minutes of a break, have a coffee, and uh, yeah. shortly after 1.30, uh, we start at 11.30, 11.30, we Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>